Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the premiere edition of Kidney Disease Editorial Edition with Kenneth Sorensen. Uh, tonight, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, my history. In addition to that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, what the show is going to be about. And towards the end, I'm going to talk a few kidney statistics to see if uh, if any of you guys know some of the some of the issues around the world and in the United States with kidney disease. Uh, to start off, I'm from a town outside of Charleston, South Carolina, named uh, Goose Creek, South Carolina. Um, Goose Creek is a predominant Navy town, and that's why I came here. Uh, we, My family moved here in 1984 uh, to follow my father, who was in the Navy for 26 years. I have a younger sister and an identical twin brother. Um, my father passed away a few years ago, but I'm very close to my mother. Um uh, the kind of the start of um, our, my kidney problems all stemmed from diabetes. Uh, my twin brother was diagnosed with diabetes when he was 18, and I was uh, diagnosed, I think, around 1920, somewhere around there, so not too far after. Um, I was, I kind of knew the signs, and I went to my doctor and said, "Hey, I have it," you know. But when you're 19, 20 years old, you don't think anything is going to happen to you. So I didn't do a good job of taking care of it. I was probably the picture of the way you don't want to be when you're handling a disease like diabetes. I ate whatever I wanted. I didn't uh, exercise. I didn't worry about any of that. Um, but uh, fast forward a few years, and I was actually um, uh, told by my primary care doctor to go see a nephrologist. And so I went to a nephrologist and I already had stage three kidney disease. Um, it was really scary, but I, of course, still didn't think of any because I wasn't feeling any effects from it. Uh, I was in the luxury hotel business for a very long time and working 78 hours a week, um, still not worrying about uh, staying healthy and, and any of that. And, uh, you know, Steve talks about it all the time. You know, uh, a huge part of correcting kidney disease has to do with diet and exercise, um, cause diabetes and hypertension are the two largest factors in, uh, kidney disease. Um, I also later developed hypertension probably due to my kidney disease, but it could be from diet and exercise also. Um, I, uh, started going to the kidney doctor and, um, and working. And then eventually I got to the point, um, that I could no longer work. Um, and so I stopped working and so I lost all sort of insurance. Um, uh, uh, luckily, I had an amazing doctor, uh, and um, he, as soon as I hit the 20% kidney function mark, started me on uh, dialysis just so I could get um, Medicare. So I went, uh, I went and got Medicare, so I started doing dialysis. I started with PD. I did PD for about a year, and um, I had to stop because I was having stomach issues that uh, we just really couldn't uh, explain. what We knew what was causing it. We didn't know if PD was making it worse. It was gastroparesis also stemming from diabetes. Uh, I did that for a while, and then eventually they put me on hemodialysis. Uh, for about a year and a half of my hemodialysis, I actually was on um, – I had a catheter. Um, they couldn't get a fistula or graph. I have a, a, a completely uh, non-functioning fistula and graph, graph in my right arm. Um, then they actually took me off of dialysis for a little while because they thought it was making my stomach problems worse again. Um, in like 2017, beginning of 2018, I was actually um, in the hospital for a good majority of that time because of my stomach issues. Um in in late 2017, I got a gastric pacemaker, and um, and so now I'm doing much better. It's finally started to work, that kind of thing. Um, so I went into uh, – then I went back to dialysis after a few months of being off of it because my, um, my uh, creatinine level had gone up to 13.5, and my doctor no longer wanted to keep me off of it. Um, so – so that gets us up to, you know, pretty close to, uh, uh, towards the, uh, towards the beginning of 2018, um, uh, February of 2018, I was put on the transplant li list at the medical university of South Carolina. You'll hear me mention it probably a good bit. MUSC is the name of the, uh, that was what we call it. Um, it took me a while to get on the transplant list because of my stomach issues. They were worried I wouldn't be able to keep down the anti-rejection drugs. Um, so that, uh, that occurred. I finally got on the list between 2018 and 2019. I was a backup for a deceased donor 18 times. Oh, I'm sorry. Eight, eight times, not 18. Um, 
and there's probably not much more frustrating than that. Uh, you get your hopes up, uh, and then you, you know, either don't hear from them again, or you hear from them, you know, a few hours later, sometimes they tell you not to eat for that entire time. One time I think I went 16 hours without eating because they told me not to only to find out I didn't get the kidney. Um, I was lucky because I'm, I'm pretty young in comparison to a lot of people that are looking for kidneys, um, or trying to get on the list. Uh, so, um, back in, um, January, January 24th, um, I got the call that I was going to get a kidney from a living donor. Um, uh, the, the catch is I didn't know the donor at all. Um, uh, one of the interesting things, uh, part of it is two days before that, on that Tuesday, I was to back up again. Um, uh, so on the 24th, I got the call and they said, uh, you know, could you do the transplant on the 13th of February? And I said, yeah, of course I can do it anytime. Um, next thing you know, I'm kind of freaking out because I don't want anything to happen between the 24th and the 13th. Um, you know, I could get sick. The donor could get sick. Um, you know, all kinds of things could happen. Um, and so I was, you know, obviously extremely scared and nervous, uh, but we got to it. And, um, and on February 13th, I had a transplant, um, and it, the kidney started working immediately. Um, I, uh, the doctor even commented of how much urine the kidney was producing immediately. I want to say it was like 13 liters within the first day or within the first overnight. Um, the doctor was kind of, uh, you know, extremely impressed by it. Um, uh, I was up and walking that next day. Um, I think I walked every hour on the hour. Um, those of you that gotten transplants before real know that the nurses have to check your vitals every hour just because they're worried about, you know, it not taking and things like that. So I took the time to get up and walk during that. I met my donor the next morning at 7 AM. She was walking around and she told me, um, she asked the nurse if uh, she could meet me. And, um, the nurse came in and asked and I of course agreed. And so, uh, I got to meet her. She's an amazing woman. Um, and, uh, she lives a little bit outside of me, about two hours away in a town called Aiken, kind of on the Georgia border. Um, I still communicate her on a fairly regular basis. She, she saved my life. She's a hero. Um, so, so I got the transplant. I've been obviously working really hard since then. Um, I've been, uh, I, you know, about a month before I started exercising, um, before I even knew I was getting the kidney. I, I've been eating healthy, you know, those kind of things, trying to get going. It's really tough after about four years of basically not doing much of anything other than going to dialysis. Um, and I'm working really hard to get to the point where I want to be. I'm, I'm getting a second chance at life. Uh, Tiffany is my donor's name, gave me that chance. And I, uh, really uh, want to make sure that I, uh, do everything I can to, uh, not waste this chance that she's given me. Um, uh, so, so the transplant's been going. I'm about like three and a half months or so post transplant, um, and I'm planning on going back to school to hopefully uh, help me become an advocate for kidney patients and kidney disease, uh, like Steve's been doing, and he's doing an awesome job of. Um, I'm also, uh, I'm also uh, trying to learn Spanish. I'm volunteering now um, to help people at the VA hospital here in Charleston. Um, so I'm trying to make something of this, uh, this, this gift I've been given. Um, and, and a little bit of what we're going to talk about in this show, um, uh, the, the show is going to be a lot about kidney disease, obviously, but I want to make it kind of a, uh, an opinion based, uh, show, but I also want to make sure I have facts to back up my opinions. Um, I, uh, I think that it's really important to get some of these issues that those of us that are dealing with kidney disease or even chronic diseases in general. Um, to give voice to it. Um, you know, like we have to deal with things like insurance. We have to deal with things like being put on dialysis um, because they don't want us to get cured. Um, we, we have to deal with stuff like trying to prevent this disease. Um, this disease is a horrible disease and not many people know about it because so few people know about it. There's so few uh, things being done to prevent the disease. Um, I was lucky enough last night to be talking to a cardiologist from MUSC, and he was um, where I was. He was meeting a doctor that was visiting um, the medical university from Malawi in Africa, and um, he was telling me that um, uh, he can speak from the heart transplant position that the heart a heart transplant isn't a cure for the disease, preventing it. Or coming up with a stable something like they're working on with kidneys, a bionic kidney, is something that's 
that's what's going to fix the problem, preventing the heart diseases or coming up with something man-made to fix the problems because transplants only help a few. I I think I was reading today that something like 95,000 people are waiting for a kidney. I mean, 95,000 people, that's an incredible amount of people uh, are waiting for a kidney. Um, And um, obviously, you know, there's very few living donors that are willing to step up. I know in my case, not a single person I knew got tested for uh, a kidney because it's a lot to ask for someone. And and and, and uh, it's a hard thing to ask for. In addition to that, it's hard for them to actually donate. Um, um, but um, a kidney, you can at least get a living donor, like things like hearts, lungs, things like that. They have to be deceased. Um, and I think that's a super important thing to talk about donation. Uh, I'm also going to do something on transplant. I'm going to talk about, um, talk about from a recipient's perspective, but I'm also going to talk about it from a donor's perspective. I'm going to speak to my donor and other donors and get kind of their thoughts about the process and things like that. I'd really like to, um, to find a way to kind of show people that, donating does save lives. Um, we'll, we'll even talk about, you know, signing up for, you know, I know in South Carolina, you do it when you get your driver's license, trying signing up to be an organ donator after you, you're deceased. Um, I was talking to a family member today and, you know, if you think about it, you know, you're not going to need these organs. Why not save people's lives? Um, we might even talk about some philosophical things. Like, um, when I, the day I went to check in for my transplant, the lady at the front desk told me that she didn't think, um, Uh, that God would want transplants. And she was very nice about it. I obviously disagreed. And I said to her, you know, uh, she's like, well, God didn't build you with that organ working correctly. Then you shouldn't, then that was God's will. And I explained to her, but he also gave the people that do the transplants and came up with the transplant process, uh, the same tools from God um, to do that. And so um, we'll talk, we might talk about some of the stuff like that. Um, I, the next show is going to be on dialysis. I've uh, worked really hard to study uh, dialysis um, from every aspect I can think of. Um, and I'm sure I'm going to miss some things. Um, so that's where you guys come in. You can find me on Facebook. My name is Kenneth Sorensen. I'm probably the only one from Goose Creek, South Carolina. Um, just, uh, send me a friend request or even a message. And, uh, and I would love to, you know, discuss things that you, that you guys can think of about it. Um, but I've studied the history of dialysis. I've studied, um, the, the numbers on dialysis. I've studied, um, particularly the major dialysis company, which is DeVita. Um, there's two major ones that run 70% of the dialysis clinics in the country. And, um, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Um, I'm going to talk about, um, dialysis in other parts of the world. Um, uh, speaking of that doctor in Malawi, um, she, Malawi had their first kidney transplant like last week. Um, uh, and so they're really excited about it. I was talking to her about it. I guess doctors from India came in and did the transplant. And, um, I asked her what dialysis was like in her country. And she said, um, the, the kidney disease is just starting to become a big issue in their country. And so they actually don't have any dialysis clinics that she's aware of. Uh, they do some dialysis every once in a while in the hospital, but other than that, they don't really, uh, do dialysis in her country. So we're, we're definitely going to talk about that a little bit, uh, too, um, what dialysis might be like in other parts of the world. Um, the first segment that I'm going to do on it, we're going to talk mostly about, we're going to talk mostly about this country, but I'd like to get feedback from people from other parts of the world that uh, that don't have uh, for-profit dialysis and find out what it's like, you know, like in the UK or Canada or um, Australia, for instance, uh, those countries don't have uh, for-profit uh, for-profit dialysis clinics. So I'm curious what those are like. At some point, um, I've talked to some people about maybe joining me and giving me their perspectives. Like my donor, for instance, said she'd be interested. Um, I also talked to my kidney doctor and he said, uh, he may, he may come, come on and, um, he can talk about it from a, uh, a caring doctor's perspective, as opposed to a for-profit doctor's perspective. Um, uh, he works for a company that's for profit, but he certainly is a patient centered doctor. And we all know that uh, those of us that have any sort of chronic illness knows that those doctors are worth their weight in gold. Um, so I'm going to have him on hopefully at some point. Um, I've talked to some other people like, you know, um, I would like to have Steve on at one point to talk about what it's like to be a dial- dialysis nurse and see 
um, the the kind of things that he's seen over his career about dialysis. Uh, I know Steve is very fired up about dialysis. Uh, dialysis is a, a huge issue in this country, um, and you know, um, and so much money spent on it. Um, and are, are we getting our money's worth out of it? Um, I personally do not think so. Um, the the next thing, the uh, other things I'd like to talk about is. The healthcare system in the United States, it's obviously a hot button issue, and I'll try not to talk to uh, talk about it from a political uh, kind of mind frame. But um, I think it's very important to to discuss what it's what's going on in this country when it comes to health care, uh, because um, a lot of us, uh, a lot of people die because of it, and particularly kidney patients. Uh, as most of you know, kidney disease is now the ninth largest uh, killer in the country. Um, it affects it affects so many people. Um, I think I saw a, uh, a, uh, uh, thing on Steve's Facebook page about, uh, nine out of 10 African Americans have some form of kidney disease, most of whom don't even know it. Um, you go into a dialysis clinic, you see all kinds of faces, um, you know, that kind of thing. And, and, uh, and right now it's affecting a lot of older people, but if you, those people that have been doing dialysis a long time in particular see that the faces are getting younger and younger and younger. Uh, when I started four years ago, I was the youngest patient at my dialysis clinic. By the time I left, I wasn't no longer the youngest. And it wasn't just because I was getting older, it's because they were getting younger. Um, so um, we, we need to talk about that. We need to address that and, and how uh, we can prevent things. I'm also going to do an an episode on, you know, health and, and exercise. Uh, the reason I want to do that is because those are the two main ways that people can avoid this disease. Uh, this disease is, um, is definitely a killer. Um, I, I know I've seen people die from it and, and the, really the only way to do it is to avoid it or to help yourself through it is to take care of yourself both physically, um, and mentally. Um, we're going to have an episode on, um, depression um, going along with chronic illness. It's definitely prevalent. I know I, I, I know I suffered from it. Um, I never sought help for it, um, but I definitely, definitely feel like I su- suffered from it. It got to the point where even if I did have the energy, I didn't want to leave the house other than go to, going to dialysis. Um, I live in, I live in a state um, and and I've talked about this before, but I live in a state where um, diet and exercise are definitely not priorities. Um, there's a lot of other stuff this state ignores too, but um, education is a huge key. Uh, the doctor at MUSC I was talking to last night was telling me that, um, you know, uh, the state of South Carolina, the hot medical university of South Carolina, which is one of the better hospitals in the country and without question, the best hospital in South Carolina only gets one to 2% of their budget from the state of South Carolina. Um, which is ridiculous because it's the only transplant center in South Carolina. Uh, and yet again, it's the best hospital. It's also the only medical university in South Carolina um, or the best medical university in South Carolina. I think it's the only one, uh, but they have to find other ways to raise money because the state doesn't give them the money. Um, they also don't spend a lot on education system, which um, if you study health, you know, the better educated a group of people are, the tendencies they have to have a better uh, grasp on maintaining health and maintaining um, a healthy lifestyle. Um, and uh, having grown up in the South, we moved here when I was five years old. Having grown up in the South, um, I can tell you that um, that health is is ignored greatly in this state. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, I, I could speak from the Southern state perspective. I know there's other people uh, on this network that uh, are from various parts of the country, you know, New York, uh, uh, Maryland, those kind of things. But I, I'm kind of in the heart of the South. Um, um, and I live uh, really close to what's called the Holy City. So I'm definitely in the Bible Belt. But I can speak from uh, a person that's not necessarily a Southerner, because both of my parents aren't from here. But I, I can speak from someone that's grown up in the South and knows the South uh, pretty well. And so um, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, I, I definitely want to get some show ideas from the people listening too. So if anyone has one, definitely send me a message. Uh, yet again, I'm Kenneth Sorensen and I'm on 
about Facebook. Um, I'm from Goose Creek, South Carolina, in case there's other Kenneth Sorensons. Um, and but definitely send me friend requests and, and show ideas because I, I would love to research anything that, um, that you guys are interested in um, because I want to make sure that I cover things that are going to interest the people watching because um, because you're more likely to spread the word and to spread uh, not the word of the show necessarily, um, but that would be nice. Uh, but I'd also like you to spread the word of the disease. Uh, I, I know um, I've become uh, pretty uh, good friends with Steve over the last few weeks um, since I did his show a few weeks ago. And um, he is trying to spread awareness of what he's doing on um, his network is just beautiful. Uh, you know, his, um, his, his videos of dialysis clinics and how close they are to each other. The one the other day about a dialysis clinic that was close to a funeral home or a, a, or a place where you prepare funerals. Um, I mean, that's just, you know, that's just showing you how much the people um, realize that dialysis is like a death sentence. Uh, um, and so, you know, his, him spreading the word about that and he does all kinds of events in order to show everyone how important it is to, uh, try to stay off dialysis. It's it, it was never meant as a long term solution. Uh, there was one lady at my clinic that had been on it seventeen years. So, so um, we need to spread the word. Uh, you know, I'd love for people to watch the show, but I, I it's even more important to me to get the word out about this disease. Um, and and so uh, you know, a few things I w I do want to mention, and I'm going to use my cheat sheet because uh, my memory is not that great. Uh, but um, but I've got some facts about um about kidney disease in general. Um, one of the craziest facts I read was 10% of, uh, of the world apparently has kidney disease. Um, and, and it, uh, it, you know, in its various stages, 10%. Um, last time I heard, you know, population of the world is around 8 billion. Um, so if you think about that, I mean, that's, you know, you know, that's, that's a crazy amount of people that are, uh, suffering from kidney disease. Um, in the United States, uh, the, the figures are uh, last I checked. And yet again, I've heard various forms, but um, I heard from about 460,000 to about 600,000 people are, are have kidney disease. Um, 193,000 have, um, have a kidney transplant. Um, and so you're, 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 you could be as much as you know, almost 800,000 people suffering from some form of kidney disease. Um, uh, also, um, uh, also, um, to give you an example, um, global burden of disease study, chronic kidney disease was ranked 27th in the list of causes of total number of deaths worldwide in 1990, but it rose to number 18 in 2010. The degree of movement up the list was second only to that of HIV and, and AIDS. So if you think about it, the, the, the fastest moving up the list of, uh, killers in this world is kidney disease. I mean, think about that going from 18th to, um, to, or from 27th to 18th in, in a 20 year period is a, is a pretty crazy amount. Um, right now they say that, uh, that, that 10% number I gave you earlier, the only caveat to that is it's going up rapidly because countries like China and India, as they industrialize, uh, the worse their diets are becoming and the less they're exercising, the more they're worried about making money. Um, I'm not one of those people that don't think money is important, but I do think there's things that are more important, like living. Um, also, uh, two million people worldwide currently receive treatment for dialysis or a kidney transplant to stay alive. Uh, but this uh, only represents... 10% of the people that actually need treatment to live. Um, so, you know, uh, we talk about education about the disease. So, so the amount of people, which, as I said, is uh, 2 million people worldwide, um, there is, and there's 10% of the world that has kidney disease. So there's so many people that don't even know they have it and that are dealing with it. Um, I, I mean, I was one of them. I couldn't understand why I had no energy. I couldn't understand why I wasn't feeling well. Um, I really couldn't understand what was going on with me and no one decided to check my kidneys, even though I had been a diabetic for, you know, almost 20 years at that point. Um, so, uh, you know, it's your, it's your job to, uh, to kind of, um, advocate for yourself, get tested for things, especially if you have hypertension and diabetes, um, get checked for those, those kind of things. Um, I am going to do a show on, on diabetes probably and hypertension, uh, may join them together, but, uh, 
I'm not an expert on those things. I'll definitely do some research, but I can tell you I've gone through a lot because of both of those problems. So, so um, I, I'll share my personal story about um, dealing with especially diabetes. Um, it, it, it's, you know, it definitely could be shortening my life because I didn't take care of it. Um, and that's a di- also a disease that's non-diagnosed. Uh, uh, and uh, so we need to spread the word about diabetes and hypertension too in relation to kidney disease. Um, so, so I think, you know, those are definitely things that I want to go over also. Um, also, um, uh, okay. So, so some other, some other stats, um, in China, the economy will lose about $558 billion over the next decade due to the effects of death and disability attributed to heart disease and kidney disease. Yes, that's $550 billion, um, which, which if you think about it, um, uh, the United States probably spends, uh, you know, you know, we're, we're heading in that direction too. And we're a uh, much smaller population to China. Um, you know, 1% of the U S budget is spent on dialysis and kidney disease, um, which is a fraction of what we need. Um, um, I believe the numbers are um, to, to do research on kidney disease. They spend two to $3 per patient for, um, for cancer patients, they spend about two hundred to three hundred dollars per patient to research. AIDS, it's two to three thousand dollars per patient. So think about that. Um, uh, how much money? How little money in general is spent on research in kidney disease, as opposed to um, trying to uh, trying to uh, most of the money in the budget is spent on dialysis or or kidney doctors and things like that, as opposed to researching what we can do to stop it. Um, researching things like bionic kidney and things like that. So I, I think, um, I think if you look at some of the statistics and, and the statistics I talked about, um, uh, are, are from the national kidney foundation, uh, website. So, you know, I, I don't know, it, it's really hard to be accurate on these kind of things, but I think that, uh, that's a pretty good reference point, uh, uh, also, a country like Uruguay, the annual cost of dialysis is close to 23 million U.S. dollars, repre- representing 30 percent of their national budget. 30 um, percent. And, and oddly enough, that's obviously very low compared to what we spend in the United States, because our budget, one percent, is is uh, somewhere around um, somewhere around 46, 47 billion dollars. Um, but 30 percent of their budget is, is, is an enormous amount to spend on dialysis. And that's a country that's not really industrialized. It's going to get worse for industrialized countries because um, of the food we eat. Um, uh, definitely Steve shows pictures of the, the food he's cooking and things like that. But we need fresh ingredients. We need them to be more readily available. We need them to be available everywhere. Um, not in just the rich areas. We need them to be. Then we need them in the uh, in in the city as well as we need them in the country. Um, we need them. We need them to be at a good price. Uh, there's no reason they should be way more expensive. Um, the other thing that's very prevalent is a lot of food is wasted. A lot of healthy food is wasted because it doesn't look good, even if it is good. So we need to worry about that. Um, but I'm gonna start to wrap up a little bit just to. Yeah, thank you, those of you that tuned in tonight. Uh, I'm, it was kind of disjunct because I'm trying to describe what I plan on doing with the show. Uh, as I said, next week is all is going to be all about dialysis. So we're going to talk about the you know the pros and cons, the the uh, personal experiences I had with dialysis, like how it made me feel, what uh, what I thought of it, um, the things I saw while I was dealing with dialysis. And I'm going to preface it by saying I had a great clinic. Um, I've heard some horror stories. I'm lucky enough that I didn't have that uh, that horror story, but, uh, but I am going to talk about it um, because even if you have a good clinic, it's still not a good experience. Um, we're also going to talk about the, you know, the largest company, DaVita, and and what makes them uh, such a part of the problem as opposed to part of the solution. Um, we're going to talk, we're going to have a little bit of commentary on healthcare also, because um, I, I'm a firm believer that we live in the richest country in the world. Why are people dying? Because they can't get healthcare. Um, but I definitely appreciate everyone for listening this first time. 
Um, it's going to be every Monday night from 9.15 to 9.45. Um, next week, I guess, is Memorial Day, but we'll still be doing it. Uh, you know, kidney disease doesn't rest, so I don't think I'm going to rest. Um, so I want to keep I want to keep this going, and I hope to see some of you guys again. I hope you enjoyed at least a little bit of getting to know me and the show, and I look forward to bring you other things. And yet again, Kenneth Sorensen on Facebook. If you have any ideas, please share them because I, I love to research it because I want to become a, uh, a, as my dad used to day, say, a subject matter expert on everything I can when it comes to this disease um, because I don't want to repeat the mistakes I made in the past and uh, I don't want any of you to make any of the mistakes I made in the past or that you made in the past. If I can share a little light on it, I would love to. So have a great night and uh, I look forward to hearing from you. I look forward to seeing you again next week uh, at, at 9.15 and thank you very much for uh, tuning in tonight. Have a great night. Bye.